Now, I'll also introduce the discussant for this session, uh, Annalena Opel, who's a Leverhulme Fellow at the LSE, and her work focuses on inequality, perceptions, redistributive preferences, and social protection in the Global South. And she's also a former focal point of the Government Revenue Dataset Project at UNU Wider, which I think is why we're here. Um, so, um, so Annalena, you'll have about 10 minutes, and then we'll get some um, responses from the panelists, and then we'll open the floor to questions uh, after that. Thank you for the introduction, Kyle, and thank you everyone for these very interesting presentations and for um, this session. I think I agree with um, Christian on what he said in the beginning, um, the value or like the, the importance of the perspective on data, which underpins a lot of the research that we heard about right, and um, policy analysis and advice. Um, okay, so we had these two presentations that primarily focused on the data project and then one that was a bit more applied, right? Telling a, more telling us a story that is very important and interesting. And what I also really liked about um, the presentations that we see in that we understand sort of that these data collection processes are also facilitators of a lot of collaborations and partnerships. So um, on the first presentation, our, uh, made by Christian on the tax expenditure. I was one of the people in the room who had to get a clear definition of what tax expenditure is, so thank you for that. Um, and what I also found very interesting uh, is what you mentioned in the beginning, that it can work as an important incentive for certain policy goals, right? You, you mentioned, for example, the link to climate change and so forth, so that was very interesting for me to see as well. Um, what I wanted to ask if you can give us some um, further reflections on the distributional effects of tax expenditure in terms of direct um, and indirect uh, like benefits, who's benefiting, who's missing out. Um, and also you mentioned that you want to have a rational use or promote a rational use of tax expenditure, so I was wondering if you can give us more thoughts on what rational means in that context. Um, and then I took some notes where I have to think about what I meant. <laughs> uh, in terms of, oh yeah, I found it very interesting when you spoke about the universal benchmark as well, sort of as like almost a non-positivist approach of seeing all the catalogs, what can be taxed as in then in other contexts that's not even on the radar and hence it's not accounted for. So I was wondering if there is also a rational to have this kind of like, it almost reminded me of the tax effort debate on like all the possible types of taxes that you could have and why they are not like relevant in other contexts. So perhaps there is some reflections or merits to talk about this. Um, and on the, on the data, I wanted to ask, um, when there's only aggregate data, is that a matter of reporting or is it a matter of politics as well or both? So just interested in whether there's also so, sort of like an incentive to keep some information um, covered, let's say. Um, thank you, Evgenia, also for the presentation. As a non-tax expert, I cannot give you a lot of technical input or questions, but I really liked the, the global minimum tax, so that was also something that I wasn't familiar with. And um, what I also found very interesting, and when you showed that the size sort of of the cake as in tax revenue is still increasing, it's just the composition that changes, right? Which, of course, raises important questions on the tax burden, who benefits, right? Um, in terms of profit sh shifting, I also wondered, as a, you know, sort of like outsider to this field, it's like where do they typically shift to? I mean, obviously in terms of places where they are not taxed as highly or um, sort of where, who, who stands to benefit from this um, as well. Um, and I was thinking if there is a link as well in terms of like say the global minimum tax would sort of be a remedy for this disincentivizing this behavior if there's a dialogue to be half, uh, held between you and Christian on the tax expenditure um, sort of as a tool of, a tool of setting incentives, right? Um, and on the last presentation, what I really liked as well is like um, seeing sort of that link between data, research, and policy, and practice, the partnership it builds, the workshops that um, are held like linked to 
these um, data collection efforts. Um, having worked a little bit on data harmonization, I know how tedious it can be. <laughs> and sometimes uh, it almost seems a little bit like a, an artificial process that is mainly geared to like ticking the same boxes. Um, so I was wondering if you have also in these consultations, if you have like some element of this pick and choose or trying to kind of sanitize also some certain maybe political elements of like making it fit and what information may get lost. Um, and similar to what Christian introduced with the transparency index, I was wondering if it makes also sense to have that sort of in terms of incentivize better reporting perhaps, but maybe I'm too idealistic. <laughs> um, and uh, I think, yeah, the, the, the last question I think is uh, on the last slide, which is a little bit maybe more on the content, if you have any insights as to why tax revenues have stagnated in the time period that you've been looking at, sort of. Um, yeah, thank you to the presenters, and then I'll leave the rest of the time for the floor. Are there any questions which you will moderate, right? Yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, if, if the panelists want to just sort of go one by one and respond to those um, remarks, and then we will open the questions uh, up to the floor, and if there's any online as well. Thanks for, for, for your comments. Um, uh, regarding the distributional effects of tax expenditures, um, um, as I have said, evaluations uh, on, on, on tax expenditures are rare, actually. Uh, what we see is that uh, uh, in, in, in most cases where evaluations take place, um, that um, tax incentives tend to be more regressive in their, in, in their distributional impact than progressive. Um, this said, there are some tax expenditures, uh, as for instance the earned income tax credit in the, in, in the United States and similar measure in the UK, that have a progressive impact on, um, with regard to income and also with regard to employment. So it's, it's difficult to give a universal picture, but quite often actually tax expenditures that are not um, uh, that do not aim at having a distributional impact, but aim at uh, promoting growth or incentivizing investment or um, um, promoting certain types of behavior, do this uh, by having also a regressive impact on. And, and this leads me to the question that you asked about the rational use of tax expenditures. Um, um, from our perspective, um, a rational use of tax expenditures would be able to answer two key questions. One question is, is the tax expenditure under review effective in terms of, having, um, of, of reaching their stated goals and of also not having undesired side effects? And is it superior compared to other types of public policy tools, in particular direct spending? And you have governments that include these types of questions in their pre-assessments of tax expenditure. So when you want to set up a tax expenditure, you have a certain record of guiding questions in the Netherlands and Ireland, for instance, where these questions are being asked and you have to provide uh, some type of evidence uh, with regard to that. Um, universal benchmark, it's, it's, it's a very nice question, also sitting next to OECD. Uh, it's an important institution when it comes to um, setting up and, 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 and seeing through um, in international standards. Um, that it's, not, it's not likely that in the near future we will have a universal benchmark. Uh, there are certain um, um, initiatives of, uh, of having um, regional benchmarks. ECOWAS, for instance, in West Africa is, uh, is, is uh, promoting, I'm sorry, East Africa is promoting, um, uh, or is it West Africa? West Africa. West Africa. <laughs> Sorry, um, is, is promoting th this type of, of, of regional harmonization with regard to benchmarks. From our perspective, there could, you, you could have some intermediate things in, in the sense that you could um, have a joint understanding of what constitutes a, a benchmark um, measure or what constitutes a tax expenditure. To give you an example, um, almost all countries would agree that a 
a threshold income um, below which you are not taxed with the personal income tax is part of the benchmark system. So here we would say, okay, there is an international consensus on that. But with regard to um, reduced rates for basic goods, for instance, and services, we have diversity. Germany does not consider reduced VAT rates as a tax expenditure. Most other countries would do that. And it would be nice to have a, a joint understanding with regard to those measures as well. But there will always be some kind of variation. There. And the last question was, if, if, if uh, the issue of aggregate da data versus detailed data is reporting or politics, reporting is politics. Um, <laughs> setting up those reports is a political decision. Um, governments are transparent because they choose to, do, to be so, either out of their own understanding as being good government or because there is some kind of pressure from civil society, for instance. Right? And in this sense, um, if they, are, if they do not provide um, 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 provision level data but only aggregate data, usually it's not a data issue, it's, it's, it's an issue of a decision to present the data. Anna-Lena, thank you very much for your questions. Um, regarding the first questions, who benefits from tax burden? Um, I mean, if uh, corporations shift profits uh, to tax havens or to low income, uh, to low uh, tax countries, what happens actually? Like the main uh, beneficiaries are the owners, the shareholders of corporations, and the owners of capitals. Um, and uh, if uh, we speak about uh, losses uh, of such, you know, like a movement of burden, like for example to individuals. Um, like from the research of Gabriel Zuckman and also uh, Thomas Piketty, we see like the examples of uh, even France, you know, like really rich country. In 2018, um, the, the, it was uh, the situation that um, top 10 uh, percentage of uh, rich people, so it's like about rich people, they paid in terms of the taxes less than the rest 90% of people. So like we, we speak about like poor and middle class. And uh, the same actual situation we see in US. Uh, that's why like if we it could amplify inequalities, it actually relies on the shoulders of like poor and middle class. Um, the second question, where do they shift profits uh, about like corporations and who benefits? So as I like mentioned, they mainly uh, shift their profits to tax havens. And as Annette, for example, mentioned uh, today during her presentation, uh, there is also the gravity effect that uh, they shift uh, to uh, jurisdictions that are near them, um, so mainly. But if they have, you know, like these uh, jurisdictions with the uh, low tax rates. About uh, global minimum tax, uh, would it disincentivize such behavior? Um, it's the same as uh, about uh, BEPS project. Um, it could uh, actually disincentivize them, so it could uh, actually um, move some of the profits from tax havens. But uh, there is no uh, evidence, I mean, now because there is no data of implementation of global minimum tax, so it's going on. But uh, there is a, a set of the literature that actually simulates the global minimum tax implementation. And what it shows that in comparison with like developed countries and developing countries, developed countries uh, could benefit more. And the reason of it is that, uh, for example, for developing econ economies, um, they rely a lot on uh, investments and uh, like uh, attracting investments, especially with uh, special economic zones. And uh, such uh, a policy, global minimum tax, could, could actually disincentivize in investors like to invest in uh, their government, like in their countries. Um, and uh, uh, there also was the discussion of the rate that should be implemented. So now it's like 15%. But for example, in the book by uh, Gabriel Zuckman, he uh, suggested like 23%, if I'm not mistaken. Like, and uh, um, African countries also like suggest the level of 20% uh, and higher. So yeah, th there is a huge discussion. And, yeah, about global minimum tax. Thanks. 
thank you very much uh, for your uh, comments. Uh, I, what I, I think I took down two questions, and forgive me if there was, I think there might have been a third, but I was already trying to think what the answer to the first one was. So, uh, please remind me if, if I missed one. So the first question was, what information gets lost in the harmonization uh, process? That's an excellent question. Uh, that's why I was already starting to uh, panically think uh, what the answer might be. And then the, uh, the no less complex, but perhaps more answerable question of why uh, tax revenue stagnated in 2010. So uh, on the first question, absolutely. Uh, information gets lost in, in I suppose, uh, the, the first issue that we have in the harmonization is what constitutes a tax. So the OECD has a definition of tax revenues, uh, and it has also thankfully uh, expanded it more into, into non-tax revenues as well. But for, uh, for, for now, the big discussion is, or, or a common discussion with uh, our country focal point is whether or not uh, what they can, might, may consider a tax instrument actually is a tax instrument. Uh, and because of these, uh, the OECD's definition, it means that some countries' uh, revenues, for example, from uh, natural resources, don't go into their tax to GDP ratio, which is very contentious because then they see uh, it looks as if they're performing much worse than they would consider themselves when they look at the tax to GDP ratio. So, first of all, uh, you know, the OECD definition of taxes as compulsory, unrequited payments to general government sounds eminently sensible, but that leaves various things out. And so I'm pleased, as I say, that we're now looking at non-tax revenues as well for uh, Africa and the Asia Pacific, uh, because that allows us to, uh, to get a more complete revenue picture. And so we'll continue to do so, um, obviously. Then within, when it comes to different uh, tax types, I think it's, it, there are fewer discussions uh, the discussions are perhaps a bit more straightforward because the OECD classification is, for the most part, uh, very clear and it's pretty well disaggregated. It's, it's pretty granular. So uh, where there is uh, perhaps disagreements with the na national focal points, often the national focal point will, will, may carry the day because you know, they, it is up to them ultimately whether or not we publish their, their data. But for the most part, this, I think this is very, very marginal because for the most part, the, the classification is very clear. Uh, now, as to why tax revenues uh, have stagnated in developing countries, uh, well, and to an extent the OECD as well, in, since the global financial crisis, first of all, uh, I think a couple of caveats to that. First is the, the way the tax to GDP ratio in the nature is formulated. Obviously, it also depends on what's happening with GDP. So if uh, an economy grows at 10% uh, a year and tax revenues grow at 10.1% a year, it might not lead to a great jump in your tax to GDP ratio, but it would be unfair to say that tax revenues are stagnating. They're just, you know, they are, they're, they're sort of holding fine. So there, it shouldn't be necessarily the case that there's been no growth in fiscal space in developing countries during the 2010s. On the flip side, of course, as interest payments have uh, become more onerous, actually, you can easily say that fiscal space has narrowed. So one of the, uh, we looked prior to the pandemic even at the proportion of increase in tax revenues in African countries that has been eroded by the growth of debt servicing costs, and it's about two thirds. So uh, that, and that was pre-pandemic, so you'd think it would be even higher. And so there, there are these different dynamics uh, to, to take into account. At the same time, these averages are, uh, you are looking at an average for 33 different countries in, in Africa. Now, there's a lot of heterogeneity, not only in the level, but also in the, uh, the trajectory. So a country like Togo uh, in 2010 was a couple of percentage points beneath the African average. Now it's a couple of percentage points above. It's been a hugely successful period for them, involving a lot of reforms to, uh, to tax policy, to tax administration, huge political commitment. It's a great story to see. On the other hand, you have countries where the, there's been uh, declines as a percentage in revenues as a percentage of GDP. Often, we found that this relates to, uh, to mineral pr uh, producers or oil producers where uh, they've had huge falls in line with uh, falls in, in oil prices. Uh, now, maybe in 2021, 22, that these, will, these will pick back up, but these are incredibly volatile revenues, and so there's a lot going on be beneath that story. I would say 
All that being said, persistent informality is a huge constraint on the expansion of uh, uh, revenue from tax sites that are currently, as we saw on that final slide on the tax structure, if you don't address informality, your PIT revenues won't grow very much and neither will social security contributions and that hopefully has interest to you as a sort of social protection researcher. Uh, and then there's also just you know, the slow pace of economic diversification in, in, in many of the countries that are covered. And so that's, uh, I think, one of the things that UNEY wide is such a, it does so well at, at, at it provides that big picture. It, it, it looks at, tech, at revenue mobilization from the perspective of the overall uh, diversification and development of the economy, and I think that's something we should never uh, lose sight of. Uh, oh, that's it. Um, thanks so much. So we have somewhere between five and ten minutes left. Um, so. At this point, it would be good to take some questions. Firstly, are there any questions online? No. Sadly not. Do we have any questions in the room? We have two, three, four, okay. If they're brief, we could take, let's take the first two that went up, so Ar Helge and yourself, and then we come back. Thanks. All four? Christian's confident he can handle four questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have first a question to Evgenia. Uh, very interesting pre presentation. But both interesting, but seriously good. I have much to learn how to do a proper presentation. My question is related to what do you have information on the sectors of these multinational companies? What sectors are uh, most aggressive when it comes to profit sh shifting? And second, where are the headquarters of these multinational companies? Then I have one question to uh, Alexander. Uh, there are now uh, quite a number, several uh, government revenue data sets available. You have the IMF, which has existed for decades, I think. Uh, uh, you have the Univida government revenue data set, and now you have the OECD. And when you look into and try to compare, you find also the inconsistencies here. Uh, and you find also that the user friendliness of these data sets are different substantially. I must say that I'm most impressed of the Univida government revenue data set. If I want to make a presentation, I go there. Um, very intuitive, easy to use. And my question is, do we need all these data sets? Um, what is the added value uh, of, of producing more and more? Wouldn't it make sense, given that there are also inconsistencies in the data between these different uh, databases, that one aim to join forces and develop one kind of har harmonized type of data set which actually had more reliable, credible uh, uh, data, and which then would be more cost-effective to operate. Thank you. Yeah, so there was one I just I in front. I should say who I am. I'm Odd Fjellstad from the CMI Berg in Norway. Hi, my name is Christina, and I work for the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, where the secretary is located here in Oslo. Uh, my first question piggybacks on your comment. Um, our 57 implementing countries report tax and non-tax revenues disaggregated by company level and uh, type of, pay of revenue. And we map those to the uh, GFS uh, classification. So what's the value add of another cl classification? Because this one has been established and all our countries are already doing this work. And doing another mapping is extra work, and we should be analyzing the data. So I want to be a little bit provocative. What's the value add? Um, because we were already doing this, and we have been for almost 20 years. Um, and for you, Christian, I had a question. On, uh, one of the things that we see happening in our research-rich countries where we have state-owned enterprises that um, play an important role, um, there's this issue of quasi-fiscal expenditures. Um, I was wondering if this is also part of the data set or the issues that you're working on because we see a lot of countries struggling with understanding what that is and what the importance of that could be. Thank you. OK. 
Okay. Do you want to take one, maybe one more question before responding, or is there one more, yeah. Daniel? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, we're we're eating into eating time, so. Um. Some of my questions might, might have been uh, raised already, so I would go back to them. And let me add, this question might apply to Alexander and probably to some extent Christian. First of all, thank you for those presentations. One of the frustrating things a researcher might encounter is when you're working with tax data and then you find out that there are some countries of interest, but there are no data points for those countries. Or you might find some countries of interest and if you look at the period, you notice that there are gaps. Um, I know over time there's been some improvements, but probably I would like you to reflect a bit more on what the challenges are and how this has been addressed over time. Okay, thanks. Um, let's say between one and a half and two minutes response each, and then we'll, um, we'll wrap up from there. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. Um, I would be brief, actually, <laughs> because uh, so what, uh, the, the first question was uh, what sectors are more aggressive multinationals? So yeah, we have this data, but I need to look at the data back in order like, to answer you properly. So we have this data, that's right. But we don't really show this in the paper, the disaggregation among sectors, because the most important like, thing was about aggressiveness like on multinationals. And the second is like headquarters, so this multinational. So uh, what do we have? So as you, like, you remember probably from the slide that we, like in the end, we have uh, 20,000 of subsidiaries um, among multinationals. And um, uh, the, the exact number was uh, 842 or 43, I think. Like, uh, it, they belong to domestic multinationals, so this this is disaggregation. But again, like the headquarters, I mean the countries, so we need to look back in the data. Like we have it, but we need to go look back. That's it. But thank you very much for these questions. I think that we need to add this uh, to the paper. It's worth it. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah. You from EITI, you know, of course, that the extractive uh, sector poses all kinds of challenges with regard to transparency and data collection and uh, tax expenditures are uh, of course not alien to the situation quite to the contrary we know that many tax expenditures in the extractive sector are granted through agreements and they do not appear in the reports so uh, this is one issue and the second issue with regard to state-owned enterprise and quasi fiscal expenditure um, at this moment we do not have it on our screen, actually. And I think it's also, again, an issue of data. But let's follow up directly afterwards. I'm very much interested in hearing your thoughts about this. And with regard to data gaps, um, from our perspective, uh, with regard to tax expenditure, the key issue is the quality of reports. This decides over the data that we have in our database. And um, what we do is we, we we, we uh, see this as a major policy challenge at, at, at the national and at the international level and try our best to advocate for better reporting. That's what I can say about this. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for, so thank you very much. <laughs> uh, no, so this is, uh, thank you very much for your questions. I, uh, I don't, I'm not sure this is, uh, it, is not the appropriate uh, moment for me to make a comparison or explain the strengths and weaknesses of the respective uh, databases. I would say uh, two things, uh, and I, I don't want to, because this has been sort of discussed as well, I don't want to quote people without their permission, but I think it has been said uh, frequently that the the data space uh, today is unrecognizable from where it was 10 to 15 years ago. There has been uh, a great development in the quality of data available. Now, as ever, development is uneven. It's a process that will you know, move forward, step back, there'll be rationalization. Um, 
it's a work in progress. Uh, and I can say that from the OECD in 20, 2018, I think we covered 80 countries, which is barely worth enough to call it global. Now, by the end of the year, we'll be at 130. So we, we're getting there. And I'd say that we're also improving the, the quality. We have the opportunity, thanks to the partnerships, thanks to donor support, we have the opportunity constantly to be improving the quality of data. And I think Carl would accept that uh, would agree that, that there's, there's filling the data points and there's actually filling it well with good quality data and I think we benefit from this when we pool our experiences and our expertise and we, we have these different people who are perhaps accessing different information and you know over time the, the data that everyone is, is having access to is, is getting better and it's not necessarily it's not an easy conversation to have uh, on a panel but we are, the OECD Res, uh, Global Revenue Statistics uh, Initiative is, is a response to country demand. We don't we have no uh, persuading power on countries uh, to join. We invite them, and if they see the value in the initiative, then they join. Equally, the regional partners could walk away at any time. Equally, the donors on whose support we rely might not see the value of it. So we, I think we will c carry on doing what we're doing, and we will do the do it to the best of our abilities and in the broadest consultation possible, knowing that exactly you are having these discussions and it's confusing and you might wonder why, but it is. I think it's beholden on us to make to have a, a clearer answer to that picture, uh, to that question, uh, perhaps over time uh, than we do today. But in any case. Uh, I do implore you to just contact us to reach out because the differences you might see, we are working on all the time and uh, they, I would say the inconsistencies are getting much, much smaller. And we, as a final note, we have a, a bridge table uh, in our publications where you can com combine the OEC, compare the OECD classification with the IMF, for example, and just see exactly where the, the commonalities lie and also all our documentation is, is at least transparent and it's publicly available and so you will be able to see if you're curious as to where the differences lie. It's not the best explanation I've ever given, but uh, I hope it suffices at a certain level. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much to all of the panelists, to the discussant and to the audience. Um, I think it's been a really interesting session and I think we, that takes us nicely up to the coffee break. So thank you everyone. Thank you.